In our first panel this morning, our panelists will speak with Elaine Watson from Food Navigator USA about the state of the plant-based industry with an emphasis on who's currently buying and eating plant-based. Well, good morning, everybody, and I would like to extend a huge thank you to the Good Food Institute for inviting me back for a second year running. So I hope that means I didn't totally screw it up last year. So um, <laughs> my name is Elaine Watson, and I edit a trade publication called Food Navigator USA. And our topic this morning is the tipping point, why plant-based meat is going mainstream. So uh, we can argue over the next 45 minutes over the definition of mainstream and whether you know, we're drinking GFI's Kool-Aid here. But uh, I think the fact that you can now buy an Impossible Whopper at Burger King suggests that something has definitely changed. So uh, let me introduce you to our panel. So um, at the far end, uh, we have Sophie Egan from the Culinary Institute of America, who is going to provide a food service perspective. Uh, next up, we have Gil Fitz from Kroger to provide a retail perspective. Then we have Dan Altshuler Malik from New Crop Capital and Unobis Partners, and uh, he's invested in companies in the cell base or early stage companies in cell based meat, in plant based, and also in companies using microbes to make proteins. Uh, next up, we have Anu Gol from Spins, who's going to provide some market data. And last but not least, we have Bob Stuckey from a product innovation consultancy, Matson, and uh, Matson has worked with a ton of brands in this space. So uh, let uh, me just start by saying I'm going to conduct this like a presidential debate. <laughs> so each of my speakers will have 27 and a half seconds <laughs> to answer, and then you know warning lights will come up if they go over time, and 13 seconds for a response. So, uh, and you think I'm joking? So. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start with you, Anu, at Spin. So your data shows that uh, plant-based retail sales in the US were up 11% to 4.5 billion um, over the past year, and sales, this is just in measured channels for, yeah. for plant-based meat, more than 800 million. Um, as I said, we've got the Impossible Whopper at Burger King, we've had uh, plant-based chicken at KFC. What's going on? It seems like nine, 2019 is shaping up to be the year of plant-based meat. Why now? You know, what's changed? Yeah, so um, fundamentally what we believe we're seeing is a shift in consumption, demand, and brand supply. And so retailers are noticing this and are changing what they have to put on shelf to connect that supply to the demand. Restaurants are changing what they have on the menu. Now this has been going on for a long time, and just to put it in perspective, you know, Spins has been around for 20 years, and in that time, we've seen this mega trend towards what we call conscious consumption. And what that means is consumers are making more conscientious choices about what they buy, and that's leading to this good food movement. And they're making choices based on what's good for their own bodies, based on what's good for the planet, based on what's good for animals, and based on what's good for other people, such as brands with fair trade practices. But what's happening right now in the last three years, what we've seen is the mainstreaming of that demand and that supply towards plant-based. And what I mean by that is on the demand side, you have celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres um, saying, hey, I'm, I'm vegan, you know, or I'm vegetarian. And now everybody is saying, well, what, if she is, why don't I give it, at least learn more about it and participate? And you don't have to be vegan. You can be flexitarian, lessitarian. There's just much more approachability around the amount of people coming in to try this. On the supply side, you see the Beyond Meat burgers. I also like Daya, who's making you know, great technology with cheese that melts, like plant-based cheese that melts on nachos or on pizza. Or you have a brand like Califia Farms, who's making almond milk with the best ingredients, but also putting it in a very attractive packaging that you want to pull off shelf. And so as a result of this change in demand and supply, retailers are taking notice and saying, hey, I got I to gotta provide more of this on shelf. And restaurants are saying, I got to provide more of this on my menu. So we have a slide showing some of the, uh, the specifics here. If we can cue that up. And what, it's, what we're seeing is, I don't know if there's another uh, iteration of this. Yeah, well, we can let's keep go going. with what we have and uh, see if yep. it comes up. <laughs> yeah, it'll come up. It'll come up. So what we're seeing is across the entire store, 
plant-based products are disrupting categories. Whether it's dairy, whether it's milk, whether it's refrigerated, frozen, even center store, this is how retailers are responding to the shift in demand and supply. Mm -hmm. So what about plant-based eggs and cheese and yogurt? We're seeing strong you know, double-digit growth here, even though the dollar numbers are, are pretty small. Can you see these categories capturing a similar market share to plant-based milk? Great question, yeah. You know, so the way we, we get this question from investors all the time, how high is up? You know, is it going to be the same as plant-based milk? And I have another slide queued up for this as well. Um, well. The way we think about it is the natural channel is a great leading indicator of what's going to happen in the conventional mainstream channel. And so as you can see from this chart in milk, in the natural channel, about 30% of milk sales are from plant-based milk, whereas in the conventional channel, it's only 12%. So that gives us a sense for where the market could go in conventional channel. You can see the size of prize associated with that. But not every category. Yogurt's at 20% in the natural channel. Cheese is 20%. Deli meat's only 6% in natural channel. So that gives us a sense for a leading indicator of where the broader market might go. That's how we think about it. So Dan at New Crop uh, Capital, as an investor, how do you think about the size of the prize? Because people often say to me, um, plant-based milks have got 13% of the fluid milk market, therefore it's logical to assume that the same applies to plant-based meat, for example. But I would argue maybe the market dynamics are, are different in those two categories. So how do you see it? Well, our thesis is that that's the parity that we're reaching for. And we think that by providing the early stage capital to companies in all the different categories, we can actually accelerate that. So uh, we are seeing right now, obviously, the burger wars that are happening right now are a great indicator of what we think will happen in other categories, be it chicken, be it seafood, uh, be it cheese. Um, each category, I think, is going to have its own respective manufacturing challenges. Um, but I think that those will be flushed out eventually as technology improves. At the same time, we are seeing that this applies not just to the US, but a at a global level. Each geography has its own respective challenges in terms of distribution, in terms of price point and availability, as well as the uh, respective cuisines. But the interest is global. Uh, we are seeing it. So we have Fazenda Futuro that launched their own burger in Brazil. We have companies all over Europe that are launching their respective ones, along with all the larger corporate players. So each category will be disrupted. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. But do you feel, in terms of going back to the size of the prize, I mean, is the sky the limit for plant-based products as long as they are as good as or better than their animal counterparts? Or, you know, are we getting a bit overexcited? I think we, hopefully, we will have inverted the trend in 20 to 30 years where plant-based are the majority. And I think there's a lot of benefits that we are seeing that new generations are really interested in this becoming a part of their reality. So there's this consumer interest. And at the same time, as the products get better and better, and a consumer cannot differentiate in a restaurant between one or the other, then they will say yes. And additionally to this, we have the cost element. You know, as plant-based goes cheaper and cheaper and actually becomes more affordable than traditional animal proteins, well, that's going to make it a, a no-brainer. Okay, okay. So, Bob at Matson, um, we've been sort of talking about um, burgers a lot. So, there's a lot of beef burger uh, products on the market. Um, what about um, other areas that are perhaps underdeveloped, pork, fish, and chicken? Why is that? Yeah, I think first and foremost because the, the burger is sort of the poster child for unhealthy eating. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're gonna make one change in your diet, you could cut out burgers. And so there's, um, there's this great fit. It's, it's very craveable, and we, we have the ability to make a healthier choice within beef burgers. I think um, also burgers are quite well developed because of what they are. They're a, a, a formed product. So you're able to make the product taste better than if you were trying to do a whole muscle piece of meat, which is, I don't know that anybody's done that well in beef at all. Um, we do know also that consumers feel like when they're choosing chicken, they already feel like they're making a healthier choice. So there's, there's less urgency on chicken for consumers um, just because of perception 
I mean, they may go to a fast food restaurant and have the fried chicken on a bun, and, um, but still, it's chicken. It's not the burger, so I've made a healthy choice. Mm -hmm. And the same thing holds true for fish and seafood. They feel like that is, is a healthier choice. Um, and then again, you know, this is what we do is we, we formulate products. Uh, it's just harder to do whole muscle meat, so um, the easiest thing to do in the chicken category is a nugget, and the easiest thing to do in the fish category would be a fish stick, where you're, it's a formed product, uh, versus the whole muscle, and at least in, in North America, I, I don't know about elsewhere, the um, primary form of chicken that we eat is chicken breast, whole muscle meat, and it, for the most part, seafood also is, is whole muscle. So just. Just finally, before we move on to the retail um, side of things, I just want to go back to this issue of the size of the prize and how big this market could be, because we've had some fairly crazy kind of projections. Um, we've got Beyond Meat uh, projecting, you know, doing incredibly well, projecting annual sales of $240 million with a market cap of something like $10 billion. I mean, are we all losing our minds here? Or, you know, do, do we think that... Um, Impossible Foods saying we could replace animal agriculture by 2035 or whatever it is, that, that is a realistic proposition. I don't think we should confuse market share yes. with investor irrational exuberance. Yes. <laughs> Realistically. The trend is up and to the right mm. at the end of the day, um, and the opportunity is huge. And we're still a very, very small part yeah. of the global food supply. Okay. So, and w this, with all the manufacturing challenges that have happened in the past couple of years, if Beyond and Impossible would not have had those, who knows where their sales would be today? Because a lot of food service uh, companies still want, want to make sure that the redundancies are in place before they put products on their menus. So now that they're seeing that they're getting their act together more and more, I, I think that it'll be a greater acceleration. Yeah. OK, so let's talk about the retail side of things. So Gil at Kroger, I'm keen to get your take on the, the market opportunity for all things plant-based. You know, what are you seeing in your stores? So we're, we're seeing fantastic growth in plant-based. You know, as a retailer who has a lot of interaction and information from our customers, it's our job to provide them what they want. So we still sell a lot of meat. We still sell a lot of dairy. We see, sell a lot more organic and grass-fed meats than we used to, but we are seeing significant interest in this. And we're actually at a fantastic intersection of curiosity and culinary. Customers are really open to plant-based alternatives exactly when the foods have become truly delicious, and that's really exciting. So what about merchandising? Um, there's a lot of deba debate about um, where to merchandise these products. Some people feel the game changed when we started to see things like Beyond Meat products in the meat case, and we've had retailers experimenting with plant-based cheese next to dairy cheese. Right. What, what, are you, what are your views on that? The uh, best example I could give for that is when Kroger got very large into um, natural organics a few years ago. Mm. It, we went dense and intense so customers would walk in and go, oh wow, they're really in this business. Mm. But over time, as we would integrate those items into the set, that really would, would spike sales a lot. Mm. So customers weren't you know, writing hippie chips on their grocery list, they were writing chips. <laughs> and then they went down the aisle and they, oh, check it out, this is really cool. And so that's what we're looking to do. We will put the, the plant-based meat alternatives in the meat set, the plant-based dips next to dips, the plant-based um, sausages next to sausages. Okay. Really smart. Because I, I know some companies that I've sort of interviewed in the past have said that they don't want to alienate, especially if they started off in the natural product sector with a target audience of vegans and vegetarians. They kind of don't want to alienate their original consumers, but they still want to reach a, a wider audience. Yeah, we don't want to make it hard for them to find it. So we'll definitely communicate those, and there'll be some opportunities to still maybe make some noise and go dense and intense to announce some of the items. But, mm -hmm. but what? Customers are really going to find a lot more, and they find it more convenient. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's not always uniquely what they would buy. They don't, you know, there's a, depends on whose numbers you look at, you know, five to, you know, certainly less than 15% of the, the population is vegan and vegetarian. But over, our data tells us that of our customers, over one in three are really interested, and they view themselves as flexitarian, and they actually have a specifically intentionally meatless day at least once a week. We have, you know, female customers and our, uh, our, our female customers, 53% of them are looking to reduce meat, 44% of males. We're still selling a lot of meat, but there's a lot of interest here. And it's, it, you know, the thing that makes me excited about this is a lot of times when we're looking at tracking trends, if you're looking at um, 
or thing. So when you have to give it, give things up and go fully into a diet um, or a trend, we see they tend to fizzle out. This is an and. This is just adding to what you get to do. So if you were to look at it like looking down on a plate, you have a protein, you know, maybe you used to have half protein and half veg, and, and now you're, you're gonna have a little bit more of the animal protein, less, and then kind of fill it in with more veg, which, which is what they're doing in, in their carts and in, in, on their tables. So what about, I mean, it's kind of queued up here on the, uh, the slides there. So um, I was gonna ask you about your private label strategy um, at Kroger, and I understand you have a, an announcement to make. I do, actually. So <laughs> we, um, we have the, a, the largest natural and organic brand in the land in Simple Truth. We launched it in January 2013, um, and its customers have really resonated with it. It's, uh, last year was with sales in excess of 2.3 billion, and it's growing really strong for us. There's a lot of consumer trust in this brand, and what we are going to be do launching this fall Throughout the fall, uh, culminating in the late fall with, with burgers and, and grinds is Simple Truth plant-based. So a, a wide array of items that would either be meat alternatives or dairy alternatives. So, um, you know, plant-based burger patties, plant-based grinds, um, to a whole line of butter bean based uh, dairy alternatives. A queso that if I put it on a table in a Tex-Mex restaurant in San Antonio, people just go, these people have great queso. And you wouldn't really figure it out as plant-based until after the third bowl and you still felt great. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited about that one coming out, um, from bolognese sauces to, to uh, Alfredo sauce. And we're, what we're really finding is different plants work best for different things. You know, butter beans are fantastic for dairy, pea protein for, for, for beef. Um, our, uh, our Alfredo is cauliflower based and it's, it's truly delicious. What about, there you go. <laughs> So just going back to the issue of merchandising, because uh, the spins data that um, I saw a bit earlier this year, I think it had um, frozen plant-based meat up something like 2%, but you know, it was a big market, and then refrigerated meat was up 37%, albeit off a much smaller base. I mean, is all the action in the fridge? Not necessarily, mm -hmm. but I do think that's where a lot of the excitement right now is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there have been alternatives um, in the fr freezer section for a longer period of time. And truth be told, some of that made sense when the, when the sales velocity was less. You had longer t time to get through it, and you, know, it, you didn't have as many people beating down the door to get to the products five years ago. Mm -hmm. Now they're beating down the doors. Yeah, okay, okay. So I want to talk about the blended trend. So let's bring you in um, on this Sophie at the Culinary Institute of America. So we've got some big names in the meat industry now doing these, or about to launch these 50-50 products. Um, and also we've got um, this hitting the dairy set as well with 50-50 dairy milk and uh, plant-based products. Um, is this, you know, a gateway <laughs> to the sector for people or is this kind of the worst of both worlds? Definitely don't think it's the worst of, of both worlds. Um, for us, blending, uh, there's really, the sky's the limit with blending. Um, the beef mushroom blended burger actually started uh, with the CIA's Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative, which was uh, begun in 2011 by the Culinary Institute of America with the Mushroom Council. And really what happened was this, this concept uh, was validated through sensory testing at UC Davis by renowned researcher, Dr. Jean-Xavier Guinard. And it demonstrated that consumer liking of a beef mushroom blend was actually higher than the status quo all beef option. And so this has taken off like wildfire throughout the industry um, because of taste. And that's why it has staying power and really I don't think is um, relegated to just a gateway. Uh, it's a product now where uh, whether it's 50-50 or any number of ratios that uh, chefs and operators are, are experimenting with, it's lower in, in saturated fat, lower in sodium, lower in calories, lower in carbon footprint, lower in water footprint and quite often is either cost neutral or uh, cost savings to the restaurateur. And guess what, it tastes better, it's a no brainer. So we've seen Sodexo convert 250 school districts, we've seen colleges and universities where this is actually, uh, the blended option is the only burger that they offer because it, diners prefer it. Uh, and even Sonic Drive-In, who would have thought, right, to have the Sonic Slinger, the first uh, blended burger in a fast food uh, setting. So we really think that uh, blending has huge uh, potential in the burger category. We mentioned this is a, f a familiar form. Um, but also, you know, we really start to see the all beef burger as kind of boring, lacking imagination. Um, and the blends are opportunity for greater culinary creativity, inspiration, and by no means limited to beef and mushrooms, but, you know, white bean and leeks or lamb and eggplant, any number 
of flavor profiles, cuisine types. Uh, and then once I think, uh, for me, it's the gateway for chefs, because once you start to think about blending, uh, it appears in all manner of uh, protein options. So whether it's you know um, protein toppings that could be blended for salad bar options or for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, and, and a wide range of concepts, but beyond meat to, <laughs> beyond me, um, <laughs> poor choice of words there, but um, to other applications such as flour blends or rice blends that increase whole grain. So uh, blending as a concept I think has real staying power. So, yeah, I'm getting a pretty positive vibe from you there because <laughs> <laughs> some people have kind of suggested to me, is this the kind of meaty equivalent of mm. mid-calorie sodas, which kind of didn't please anybody, you know, mm. but... I'm getting the, any, anyone else have any choosing flavor you? profiles that are complementary are yeah. I think where you avoid that issue. Yeah. I think in developing nations mm. it might have a challenge because rich, uh, meat is considered the rich man's food. Right. So when you're offering a blend culturally your people might feel shortchanged. Right. So I think it's not going to be able to play out the same way. Yeah. Mm. So I think it's like mm. just like uh, the analogy of the plate and you're just putting more veg on your plate and if your plate just happens to be a burger bun, yeah. so be it. I, I think that's exactly right with burgers. So we know from our research that um, if you ask people what they, how they're going to get to eating more plant-based foods, they'll say, I'm going to eat more salads and I'm going to eat more vegetables. But we also know from consumer research that, that they really don't know what to do to get more vegetables. So to be able to get vegetables in the form of a burger, that's a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it works really well in, in the burger category. In other categories, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. We've actually tested the 50-50 milk proposition, mm. although that was maybe four or five years ago. Um, it bombed. Uh, it might be, have been too soon. Um, I think you know, there's a risk of trying to be all things to all people and being neither to either one. Um, but I, I honestly think that these days, the milks are so good, you know, with the, the really indulgent, delicious milks like Ripple. The burgers are so good these days. The plant-based, I mean, plant-based milks, plant-based burgers with Impossible and beyond that we may not need them, yes. right? Because the plant, the 100% plant-based are so good exactly, these yeah. days. Okay, so let's talk about food service. So Sophie, and I just want to say Sophie at the CIA. Uh, <laughs> Watch out. So, um, I want to talk about nomenclature in this market, um, especially when we're talking about the average consumer as opposed to, you know, the true believers, the, the GFI conference delegates, perhaps. Um, you've used terms such as plant-forward, plant-centric. You know, why is terminology important and what words, you know, are helpful in this market? Hmm. Definitely. So, and if I could pull up a slide. So, at the Culinary Institute of America, we are truly trying to advance a plant forward future of the food service industry. Um, so, to, to show this definition, for us, uh, plant forward is uh, defined as a style of cooking and eating that emphasizes and celebrates but is not limited to plant based foods. So, that's fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, plant oils, herbs and spices and that reflects evidence-based principles of health and sustainability. And why is this important? Because for us, it's a bigger tent approach that has the potential to reach a wider, uh, more mainstream section of the population. Um, and it includes vegan and vegetarian ways of eating, but it also includes what we call meat as a condiment, or uh, leveraging very small uh, portions of animal protein um, in the highest quality forms, most humanely raised, and so on, uh, for maximum flavor. And so what we're, we're excited about with the concept of plant forward is it's really the uh, food service equivalent. It's a B2B term from our standpoint, um, and it is the terminology that we use with our volume food service operators, and it's been embraced all across the industry. Um, it's really the, the menu availability that will meet the demands of flexitarian eating. So it has that flexibility in the course of a day to eat a vegan option, to eat a vegan breakfast, eat a vegetarian lunch, and then eat a dinner that might have had a little bit of animal protein. And for us, this is really key uh, in terms of this Big Ten approach, it's really key for the long-term viability of creating this uh, movement as the new normal, as opposed to, oh, plant-based eating was the hot trend of 2019, and then we all went back to putting an egg on everything and topping our chocolate bars with bacon. Uh, we're trying to ensure that this is truly has uh, staying power, and for us, this larger tent, uh, more inclusive, more flexible approach will be a little bit more helpful. And we reserve the term plant-based for the foods themselves, which we're really trying to increase in emphasis, uh, given the currently very sort of plant 
backward <laughs> culture of American menus uh, where you have to be this kind of salmon swimming upstream just to find even a handful of decent options on most menus. So again, so tell me a bit about the momentum we're seeing among chefs and you know, food service operators you know, in this space. The momentum is incredibly exciting among chefs and food service operators. So I'll share just three quick examples and then uh, share a little bit about what we're trying to do to accelerate that momentum. So on the fast casual side, uh, where you know customization is one of the core elements of many fast casual chains, we actually launched a really exciting fast casual watch list, uh, plant forward watch list with QSR Magazine, that's Quick Serve Restaurant uh, Magazine in May, and encourage you all to check this out because it captures the best of the best in terms of emerging chains, and it demonstrates the business case for plant-forward uh, menu options um, because it shows the variety of, of concepts in terms of global cuisine types, in terms of um, types of concepts, whether you're a bowl concept, whether you're a salad chain, uh, completely vegan, completely vegetarian, somewhere in between. Um, and it just shows a huge amount of growth that's occurring in some of these regional chains um, that are you know, going nationwide. And it also demonstrates how some, even some of the legacy brands, and some of this has been mentioned in introductory remarks, have had a lot of success from a sales perspective as, uh, with expanding the menu options. And for us with Plant Forward, it's really about increasing choice. And so what you'll see is, for instance, Taco Bell has an entirely vegetarian menu, or Chipotle with Plant Forward <laughs> lifestyle bowls. Uh, so seeing this take off in fast casual is incredibly exciting, and it's especially exciting in terms of reaching younger diners. So when it comes to younger dining, the second example is in campus <coughs> dining, which is truly a hotbed of plant forward culinary <coughs> inspiration, innovation, and enthusiasm. So the, the CIA actually is a partner with Stanford University on an incredibly exciting initiative called the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. And this is a nationwide network of 55 colleges and universities around the country that are actually using campus dining halls as living laboratories for behavior change, and specifically to understand what are the drivers and sometimes barriers to accelerating efforts towards more healthy, sustainable, and plant-forward food choices. So the, on the research agenda, this network is able to kind of determine, uh, in terms of language, wording, what might be most helpful. But on the chef side, it's really exciting to see crowdsourced strategies, menus, and uh, menu ideas, and recipes from across this network of chefs, of, of universities, uh, that really leverage globally in, uh, inspired culinary strategies. So we have a great publication that can be shared, uh, or that can be found at mosdcollaborative.org. And then the third example I would share is in K-12 school food. And this is really where the most potential lasts, right? Because we have to, tr to get the next generation uh, really excited and create positive feedback loops with exposure to, um, to vegetable dish based dishes, to plant based uh, plant proteins. Um, so we have a K-12 initiative for the Healthy Kids Collaborative that is, uh, again, has kind of crowdsourced the most kid tested recipes for Plant Forward. Um, but if I could flip a slide, what we find is really important um, is training. So we're very excited. Um, Actually, the next slide, yeah, this slide. Uh, we're very excited about a new Plant Forward certificate initiative that we'll be rolling out uh, next year. And this is the opportunity to really take advantage of kind of a, a gap in existing in the workforce right now where um, in order to make these plant-based foods that we want to move to the center of the plate, in order to make sure that they actually show up at their best and that they are something anyone wants to put in their mouth, we have to make sure that the techniques, the flavor strategies that um, chefs and operators, culinary professionals have the training. So we have this initiative that we have the, built the first phase of in partnership with Google. So they'll be rolling this out to their vendor partners, huge contract food service companies such as Compass Group, and then it'll be rolled out more broadly. And then lastly, we have a global uh, plant forward culinary summit that's actually uh, held at the CIA's Copia campus in Napa just up the road. And this uh, is a, a place to find boundless creativity in terms of inspiration from traditional cuisines around the world, as well as those great opportunities for training. Okay, wonderful. That was slightly longer than 27 seconds, but I'll give you a pass. So. Can I have my 13 second rebuttal? <laughs> no, I, I just want to say really quickly that I love what you're saying about younger consumers, because that's what we're seeing. The early adopters are millennials and Gen Z, but they're teaching up. And if they can get it into the household, particularly in the Gen Z households, or households that still have Gen Z kids at home, or if you haven't got your millennial out yet. Um, you know, they're bringing it in the house, and once you try it and realize the flavor's there, you just add it to your repertoire. I just want to ask you, Bob, about the, because we were often asked about this, about the primary and the secondary purchase drivers. Um, there's saving the planet on one side and sustainability and animal welfare, and then there's, you know, it tastes really great or it's good for me or it's healthier. You know, what, um, 
are the primary and secondary purchase drivers in your view? So. If we, in terms of eating plant, in terms of eating plant-based, mm -hmm. um, we see when we do we talk to consumers in both qualitative and quantitative research that the number one reason by far mm -hmm. is it's healthier. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It's sort of generalized health, mm -hmm. and if you sort of drill down and try to get them to articulate what healthier means to them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is different for each person, but in general, what we're starting to hear people say is, I just feel better and physically. You know, it, it, these days we, we connect our, what we eat to our well-being and our health so much more than we have in the past. And <clears throat> we're going to start to connect that more with emotional health, too. So um, that is, is by far the number one reason. And, and the other ones um, fall much lower. Uh, with regard to cultivated meat, mm -hmm. the, the reason is also health-based. Number one reason is also health-based. But it's, um, it's much more focused on <clears throat> the lack of. So trying to avoid hormone, food with hormones and antibiotics. So um, that is the, what, what our research shows is the number one reason for being interested in cultivated meat. Of course, it's not quite ready yet. Going back to this health issue, because we're starting to see articles now in the mainstream <coughs> press that have got um, nutrition facts comparisons between, say, a McDonald's quarter pounder and the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger. And they say, well, they've all got about 20 grams of protein. The um, Impossible Burger's got like eight grams of saturated fat, the same as the McDonald's one, and the plant-based ones have got like way more sodium. So are they actually healthier? Hmm. Um, are they healthier? I mean, they're healthier for the planet. Yeah, sure, and certainly for the animals. It's <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> it does great wonders for the animals. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, this is a long-term play for, for those who are in the market selling products that might have more saturated fat or more sodium than a beef burger. Um, you know, if you tasted the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Burger five years ago, they weren't as good as they are today. So they continue to iterate and, mm. and make them better. And that's not just about taste, although taste is number one mm -hmm. thing in every category, every channel. Um, but you know, getting the sodium lower and um, working on the saturated fat levels, I think that will come. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, right now it's about getting people to believe mm -hmm. that I can eat this plant-based thing that is not just good, it's craveable. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe that's a necessary evil for where we are in the adoption curve of consumers saying, yes, I'm willing to make this choice. So what about this issue of highly processed? Because that's another word you sometimes mm. hear in relation to some of these products, that if you're trying to do something that precisely mimics the flavor, the texture, um, the, the functional properties of cheese or beef, you know, you can't necessarily do that with a couple of ingredients. Um, and, you, and you need other ingredients in, in there. Again, is that a problem, or does it matter if there's 20 ingredients in a product? I think it, it will matter in the mm -hmm. long term. Um, I think that, that um, companies are wise to have a portfolio of products mm -hmm. and a, a roadmap for the future that is, may contain these more heavily processed foods, um, but also more minimally processed, so that the brand stands for more than just that to the public. Um, I will say, though, that this word processed drives me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because what does that mean? We've been processing mm -hmm. cheese and wine and chocolate sure. and coffee for, for millennia, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of food is not edible unless you process it. Mm -hmm. So you know, this is just the next evolution of that. But I do understand. We, we know that consumers, especially in the grocery store, the first thing they do is they It's like, well, I don't have methyl cellulose yes. in my pantry at home. It's exactly. Like, yeah. So I, I think mm -hmm. also that um, mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, this is an evolution. It's a long game mm -hmm. for the, the ingredients as well. Um, so I, I think, uh, again, I would say that, that the brands in the space mm -hmm. just need to have a portfolio of m more fully processed and minimally processed sure. for the long term. I so, can just build on yeah. that point real quick. You know, um, 
I like your point around it being iterative because just over breakfast, I was talking with a couple of folks in the room here, and the analogy that was used was hybrid cars. You know, the first Prius came out, version one was good. It wasn't great. Now we're on version four or five of it. It just keeps getting better. And so to your point of sodium coming down or less processed, we're just in the first round of this, yeah. maybe the second. Mm -hmm. And everybody, there's a lot of food technologists here who are working on making it even better. You know, so I think it's just going to get healthier. Yeah. So, Dan, I just wanted to sort of, before we go on to the audience questions, to sort of position where you see plant-based, going back to the size of the prize, and have we reached a tipping point, um, versus cell-cultured meats, which is a you know, longer horizon, versus producing proteins and other things through you know, bacteria and yeast and fungi and so on. You've got sort of a, a bird's eye view of all of these things. Where do you see plant-based versus some of these other technologies? Are they just inherently more consumer friendly because a plant-based burger makes sense to people? So cell-based is still not here. Yeah. But the future, when it does arrive, first, it won't arrive overnight. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be the analogy of the hybrid cars or maybe the self-driving cars, where it starts you know, with one way and eventually it ramps up. So maybe cell-based might start with cell-based fats on a plant-based base and then evolve into burgers, eventually into steaks. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the evolution of the cell-based products. Mm -hmm. In terms of how they play out, we envision a future that's a pyramid. Mm -hmm. At the top, traditional animal proteins, they will be much more expensive. They will be the grass-fed beefs of every category, um, consumed by less people on a daily basis. In the middle, it'll be the cell-based and the cell-based hybrids. Uh, which, will have, which will have a broader appeal, uh, but it still will be more expensive, and, but the majority will be plant-based. I think it's important to remember that there hasn't been that much R&D into all the different options from an ingredient point of view. So, and I think we're starting to see a lot of more people interested, be it duckweed, be it choclo, be it all these other proteins that are available, we still don't have the production because there's no demand yet. But as those ramp up, I think those will heavily influence what products are available. Mm -hmm. So maybe on a Wednesday night, you have a plant-based burger, Thursday night, cell-based burger, <laughs> Friday night, a steak from a cow. Yeah, I think yeah. as consumers, yeah. we are consuming different products within the same category from different brands all the time. Yeah. So we want choice, and it's always evolving. So brands will evolve. Uh, the larger companies should have a broad portfolio and appeal to consumers that one day they will, it'll be their, you know, their delight and they will Mm -hmm. forgive themselves for doing something, and the next day they'll be much healthier in whatever appeals to them yeah. as healthy. Can, can I just say yeah, something sure. Because I completely agree with Dan um, about the ingredients. So the supply chain, mm -hmm. you know, we're sourcing ingredients to formulate with. And seven years ago when we, we worked with an early pea protein, <clears throat> it was horrible. I mean, it, it, was, it just tastes like peas and your, whatever you were making with it. Um, these days, pea protein is clean, Mm -hmm. And it's efficient, so it's been, it's been um, isolated. You know, the, the things that we're working with continue to get better and yes. better and better, which is why the products continue to get better and better and better. And, and what I'd really actually love to see is this, this refining of the supply chain of plant-based ingredients with the, the trend of upcycling mm -hmm. ingredients from waste streams. And I think that would be the absolute mm. pinnacle yeah. of a supply chain, if we had that available. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we now got seven minutes left for audience questions. So if you haven't already downloaded the Slido app, uh, here's your chance to do so. And um, I think the code is GFC19. Yeah, OK, so I can't read those from here. <laughs> Look at my phone. OK, um, so we have a question. Uh, what is the appetite for food service providers to pay a premium for plant-based, sustainable, healthy options when they're used to buying at commodity prices? Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think one of the important things to know is there's certainly the food service industry is not one thing. So by sector, there's going to be a lot of different uh, degree of interest based on 
consumer demand, what they, uh, the margins that you can get in turn for putting that on your menu. Um, so I think from, we mentioned some, for example, if you have younger consumers, there might be a, a greater motivation for a food service operator. Um, certainly on non-commercial, there's more room for experimentation in settings like all you care to eat dining halls and things like that. Um, so there's less of a long lead time in terms of uh, consumer testing as compared with, say, fast food, uh, which just can be a little bit more difficult. So I think that the main area that we see from a cost uh, analysis standpoint is that when you start to uh, reduce the amount of beef on the menu um, or reduce the amount of other kind of high cost items, sometimes that can free up funds, if you will, for um, higher quality ingredients of all kinds. And that may include you know, um, a greater <coughs> diversity of types of uh, in you know whole minimally processed uh, plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, all those good things, um, and that may I think extend to some of these uh, you know technology-driven alternatives as well. Okay, so um, another question, um, and, and I think about this a lot because I'm a vegetarian, and um, the question is, are we too kind of myopically focused on meat and dairy analogs rather than saying? hey, you know, why not have a chickpea curry? Or um, as you say, when you ask consumers um, what plant-based means, often they say, I just want to eat more fruits and vegetables. How does that relate? I, or do I want, you know, a textured vegetable protein with, you know? Yeah. I think that's a, a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had an aha moment mm -hmm. about 10 years ago at a restaurant that served a carrot dog. And, and it, <laughs> it was a... Um, hot dog bun with a smoked, cured, whole carrot cool. in it. And we've since knocked that off. But it's <laughs> delicious. And you look at it and you go, oh my god, that's a whole carrot. I'm eating it. Boy, does that make you feel good mm -hmm. about eating it. Mm -hmm. So um, the ability to use these techniques that are used mm -hmm. with meats and, and chicken and, and pork, but to use them with vegetables, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Huge. So I, I would like to see a lot of that happening on a parallel path with meat because mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we need to have meat alternatives. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that strikes me, sort of going around trade shows as well, is that everybody's excited about the term plant-based now. So they're kind of slapping it on everything, including a lot of what you might call plant-based junk food. I mean, is that a risk? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There are definitely un unintended consequences that I think we want to be um, careful of because, you know, a vegan cupcake is still a cupcake, right? So just so long as we're still aware um, of, of the health side of the equation. And I definitely would agree with Barb. I think that the it's not either or. There's absolutely, we need technology to be part of the solution. This is an enormous shift we're talking about. But I think there's just in, ex incredibly exciting untapped potential for a wide range of um, traditional cuisines around the world that are inherently plant-based or they're inherently vegetarian, um, but they don't lead with that point. They're just incredibly delicious. And so I think consumers already have an appreciation for a variety, a greater variety of cuisine types. And that uh, sort of global um, you know, the desire to, to taste the world um, will, I think, actually be the way that brings greater people to foods that happen to be inherently plant-based. I'll just add, um, in many times, people want protein. But, and that's why they're going for analogs. But there are other vehicles to, pre to present protein to consumers. Uh, one company that I've found delicious right now, and we've adopted it at home, is Right Rice. We're taking the properties of rice that was usually did not have a lot of nutrients, and they're, provide, they're creating it with legumes and all these other vegetables. So I think the next wave of innovation is in products that do not need to resemble a hamburger, a piece of chicken, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I would say the same. If you look at, you know, we've been selling, well, if you look at the Simple Truth brand, an incredibly high percentage of what we sell is not plant-based, it's plants. Um, and so, you know, people are going to, are, are eating more and more produce. But also for years, we've sold veggie burgers that were delicious, but they, were, they tasted like a veggie burger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, customers, actually the sales and those continue to grow. Customers really love them. I, there are days that I'm really jonging for a veggie burger. The, the new inflection point is, for people that wanted something that does emulate a beef burger, now that's there too. They're both there as alternatives and options for people, and people are going to buy both. Well, on that positive note, I would like to thank my fabulous panel and give them a huge round of applause. <laughs>